Our first exploration into the science and arts is made and presented by Dylan Shaw, who earned an MFA and a certificate in screen dance from the University of Utah before continuing on to a PhD in biology at the University of Washington. <laughs> Dylan's work involves the adaptation of integrated movement of organisms in the laboratory field and on the stage. His work <laughs> focuses on bees and other creatures that dance because they inhabit such a wide range of environments and because dance is so functionally diverse. She is fascinated by the possibility of choreographing bumblebees and understanding thermal preferences of modern dancers. <laughs> Dr. Shaw's current projects include three ventures. First, a study of the physiology of dancing organisms at high altitude, using video recording of live performance to address questions of how creatures remember where they've been. Next, an investigation of adaptive movements by thinking of evolution as an editing process for life on Earth, which addresses the question, how does change occur without a phylogenetic lineage losing itself completely? <laughs> and finally, the construction of an installation to study how the thermal sensations of dancing creatures form barriers of discomfort and why they seem to prefer boundaries to being in places without obstacles. Dylan has published a number of important papers, including Transitions to a Despotic Sanctuary, Thermal Preferences in Drosophila and Dancers. <laughs> Published in the Journal of Thermal Aesthetics. And Pilgrimage to the Nth Degree, Locomotion in Cold Thin Air. Published in the Journal of Experimental Movement. And finally, Fear to Breathe. Tracheal and lung capacity does not vary with body size among bumblebees or ballerinas. <laughs> which was published in Radically Comparative Physiology and Biochemistry. Okay. <laughs> My imaginative introduction actually does reflect the genuine accomplishments of our first pair of faculty as if they were one person. And so this introduction captures something of what happened at UCROSS during our time at this magical place, a kind of playfulness that broke down barriers and a sort of irreverent humor about stodgy academic disciplines. If you'd like to figure out which parts of this introduction belong to which person, you're invited to go to the websites of Rachel Shaw and Michael Dillon to find out just how productive these people are and how conceptually entangled their creative and scientific projects might really be. And so I give you Rachel Shaw and Michael Dillon. I know, right? <laughs> um, so we're actually just going to start um, with showing a little very, very short movement study that I did. And we just want you to watch and see what it is that you see. And pay close attention because we will quiz you afterwards. <laughs> so. So what did you guys see? 
What movement struck you? It seemed like the movement was uh, an attempt to take flight or get off the ground, huh. oh, struggling see. against something to be able to take off. Any other thing? Gaining momentum. Okay. Gaining momentum. Huh. Uh -huh. And then changing the rhythms. Uh -huh. Great. Yeah. Yeah. I saw you as a bee getting nectar off the flower. Great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It seemed like you were struggling against the elements, kind of. Uh -huh. wind or some, some power. Uh -huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Good. <laughs> yeah, I think those are all really interesting ways to think about or describe what she um, was doing. Uh -huh. um, but I'm going to push you a step further. Um, what if I told you you all had a notebook to start with and you had to watch her move and then you had to be able to write down what she did right there and then communicate that to somebody else later and have them be able to read it and recreate to some degree what she did. Sounds kind of hard, hopefully, <laughs> right? <laughs> I was like, thank God I didn't have to bring a notebook. So as a, I actually study animal movement, and my response to that would be like, aha, we'll get high-speed videos and we'll put them all around her, and then we'll use some nice math to coordinate those images, and then I'll be able to track all the little individual movements of every single body part in time and then I can create this long, complicated description of what she just did and recreate it, right? Um, turns out there's a better way, um, and we won't bore you with that uh, today, the, the biomechanics way. Um, this guy, Rudolf von Laban, back in the 20s, he was actually a uh, Czech, and then he moved on to Bosnia and Herzegovina, and then he studied in Germany. He became very, very interested in movement and how people move in spaces. And working with lots of colleagues, he came with a system called Laban Movement Analysis to describe human movement. And so this was published in a book in 1928 called Kinetography Laban. And what he did is very different from what I just described doing. What he did instead is said, look, there's an essence to the way that people move, and we can capture that essence in a very different way from putting high-speed videos up. Of course, they didn't have high-speed videos at the time anyways. <laughs> but it probably helped. Um, and it starts, and there are basically four main elements that he uses to describe human movement, okay? So one of them starts with the body. Of course, we have to be able to describe the parts of the body and where they're moving in space. So we have these really interesting symbols. For example, your shoulders are given by these symbols here. And so that can describe the movements of your arms, right? But this body component goes beyond just parts. It also talks about how the parts of the body are connected to one another and organized, which is not language I would use as a physiologist biomechanist. But it's actually a really effective language. So I'm going to give you one example of that. Um, if we were to draw this shape, this is the symbol for head-tail connectivity. So, so Rachel's going to demonstrate that. The connection and the organization of the body around the head and the tail. So this would be a head-tail movement. Yeah, and okay. you can actually try that in your seat, too. Everybody head, find tail. their heads in their tail. <laughs> <laughs> <All right. laughs> yeah. So that's one simple part of this body category for this movement analysis. The second is effort. So this has to do with the quality of the movement, and more importantly, what the quality of the movement tells us about the intentions of the mover. Okay, or the attitude of the mover, all right? So one of the types, there are lots of different types of effort. There's flow effort and time effort and weight effort and space effort. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about flow effort. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to draw one symbol up here, which means bound. Oh, so awesome. Rachel's going to demonstrate that. Yeah, so bound, bound movement is the idea of keeping the inside in and the outside out. And so if I were to do a head-tail motion, really kind of trying to illuminate bound, it would be something like this. So everybody yeah. do a head-tail bound movement in your chairs. So yeah. even though you're all moving slightly differently, the, the structure and the shape and the essence of that movement is very similar, right? So that I want to highlight that I'm only giving you a few of the many pieces of vocabulary here. Um, but we're going to move on to that third category, which is shape. So this is the form of the body, right? But also what that form tells us about the attitude of the mover, okay? And so there are different types of form. One type of form that you're gonna see a lot later, so I wanna bring up, um, is a mode or a shape um, mode, and this is called shape flow. So Rachel's gonna demonstrate that. And so this is the idea of you're changing the shape of your body to relate to yourself. 
We often talk about clothes, too. So like anytime you're kind of doing this, maybe you're not really paying attention, you know, you're fixing, you know, everybody try that. Well, how would you fix something that's shape flow? Good. Yeah, and you've mostly yep. been doing this as we've been sitting here. Uh -huh. you crossing it kind of happens. You don't always know. Your pocket. So you've all been doing shape flow. Yep. Um, we can also talk about other qualities of shape. Um, so we can talk about how the form changes. So one version of that. So first of all, we're already going to quiz you. Does everybody remember what this means? Yeah, arm movement, so shoulder, yeah. movement around those shoulders. Sorry. And this, actually, when we see these together, just so you know, it means both arms. Both arms. If it's these yeah. two together. Um, and then we can have a rising movement of the arms. So everybody do a rising movement of the arms. Perfect. We can have a spreading movement of the arms. Spreading the arms. Watch okay. out. Okay. <laughs> and then, then, we, then we can actually combine those and we can do a rising and spreading movement of the arms. Excellent. Okay, three more letters and we'll have village people. <laughs> All right. So the fourth category is space. And this is one that I think more we I immediately jump to anyways when I think about movement. And that's where are you putting things in your environment when you move them, right? And so there's a very interesting symbol system for describing space. We can talk about right. We can talk about left. We can talk about up, down. We can talk about forward, so you know, moving into the plane there. And we can talk about backwards, right? And then you can actually combine these symbols. So you can actually say, I want to go uh, up and to the right. Can I combine that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So then you can add that to here. So everybody do arms. Both arms. Rise and spread, spread up and to the right. right. Yep. Yeah. So that's the second letter. You're close. Okay. So this, again, is just a small part of the language that Rachel's been patient enough to teach me while we've been here. Um, but as soon as we really start talking about this a lot, of course, I don't study humans. Um, I don't find them as interesting as bugs. Um, <laughs> and one of the bugs that I really like a lot are bees. And so I grabbed Rachel and dragged her out into the field and said, we've got to film bees and see if we can see bees moving in these same sorts of ways. So Rachel's going to tell you a little bit about the bees that we've looked at. Yes. So. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go to the next slide. So we were look in the videos that we have, so we went out and videotaped a bunch of bees. The ones that we're going to be showing you, what we're seeing is um, bees of the Andrina species. I mean genus. Perfect. <laughs> it's all a learning process. <laughs> genus. And um, we looked at, and they're, they're not exactly the same species, they're all, but they're all that, that genus. And so there were two kind of things that we we encountered as we were looking at the bee movement and trying to talk about it. The first one um, being that obviously they move really fast. Like it all looks fast to us. And it's maybe, I'm sure that, you know, we were pretty sure there were scales of fast to really fast to really, really fast, but how do we see that, right? Um, and then the other problem that we saw, that we came into is that they have a lot more what we would call limbs than we do, <laughs> right? First of all, they have another, they have lower legs. So, um, you know, antenna, wings. Um, so what we did was we took this, we used all of these, so we used this one up here for front legs, middle legs, and then we made up one here for lower legs. Okay, so we're adding to the, we're adding to the Laban notation note motif symbol. And then what we did was, so there, there are actually two kind of sets of wings, but they clip in together. And so if you split this one in half, right, that would be like lower wing, upper wing, sorry, um, hind wing and fore wing, I guess, technically. But for our purposes, we're really using it just as like both right wings, both left wings. Same thing with the antenna we added. We added some of the antenna because they do a lot of really interesting things. Um, again, that symbol at the top is for both antenna. Um, and if we, there is a version where it's split in half where it's just one and the other. But again, for our purposes, we just use it for both. Then what we did, you would see that we slowed down the bee's motion to 25%, which is, 
which is still pretty fast, actually. Um, so we could really see the details. Yeah, so we basically used a computer program to slow this thing way down and sat together and argued about what the bee was doing. Um, <laughs> and Rachel won. You can see like a lot's going on up there with the front, front legs and the middle legs. The um, antenna. And the antenna, uh-huh. And then as it comes down here and turns to the side, you can really see what's happening with those front, front legs, the four legs there. So then what we did is motifed, notated the movement. And so this is a staff down here. So this is the beginning. This is like the begin, right? Down here is kind of where it starts, OK? And then as you go through here, this is ticks. This is one second, two second, three second. Yeah, and then this is the next staff, right? So this is the beginning of the next staff going up. And again, the next staff, this is end, OK? And so it's similar in some senses to a, to a music staff. That was kind of where Laban got his idea is that, you know, instead of, though, going from left to right, if we look at this first one, there is the antenna are starting at place yeah. low, down. OK. Then this is. Do you remember what this is? Shape flow. Shape flow. And this, as you can see over here, it's happening the whole time, pretty much. And what this is, is that both arms address the front of the head, or as we would say, face. Yes, this mm -hmm. And then here, what we see is <coughs> up there, meandering starts. And what meandering, meandering refers to a pathway, which is kind of undefined. Okay, so there's meandering. Then there's a turn, a quarter turn, to counterclockwise. Okay. Quarter turn, counterclockwise. And then again, the hands address the front of the head face. Okay. Then here, this was a really interesting part. A lot was happening. <laughs> um, the antenna spread. And at, in the middle of them spreading, the, both wings spread. And then they enclose back it together again. And they paused. Then at the same time, the wings spread and the antenna spread. The antenna hold and it takes flight. This is another one we added. Fly. We've, we've added to we the language. We don't really do that. Yeah. <laughs> so that was an Andrina and Leafy Spurge. And this is a similar bee, really closely related bee on Potentilla, different flower. And see what you notice about the movement. There's a cool moment coming up. So that, the, you, see you see the back, the back legs and the abdomen? Yeah. Packing the pollen in. Uh-huh. And there's also, here, there's this big head tail motion that happens. You see that? The head and the tail came together. And it's just kind of hanging out there. Doing that shape flow, getting the nectar and the pollen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The Wiping the face. Take off. There it goes. <coughs> so this is what we notated for that one. A lot more going on in this one, right? There was a lot more motion. Um, just point out a couple of things. Here's, here's our head tail that we talked about. Shape flow kind of happening almost the whole time. The, this is a turn. This one is a circular pathway. So a turn is kind of on an axis, a circular pathway. Actually goes around. Um, we can see the little head, head motions there. We noticed there was like a head turn and then it would go, head turn, go. Um, yeah. You can see the antenna there. Flight again. Oh, this was another one we made up. Land. Because yeah. <laughs> we have one for air moment. Yeah, but we're only in the air for so long. So we needed one for land. Yeah. Yeah. So. We're going to publish that, I think, right? Yeah. <laughs> Land. <laughs> so hopefully you can see, at least to my eye, these, those two sequences are just entirely different. So same kind of bee on two different flower types, and those motions are totally different. Yeah. So here's a third one. So um, now that you are completely familiar with this analysis <laughs> system. Experts. Um, Rachel's going to narrate this score. Um, I'm going to try to do the score as she narrates it, and you're welcome to join in. On the movements. <laughs> you could stand up or do it in your chair, either way. All right. Okay. 
So, so let's see if we can do this. First thing that happens is it lands, shape flow begins and continues. There is a head tail enclosing into a ball shape. Now it's just shape flow for a little while. Then both arms address the head, which happens for a little while. Again, shape flow is still going. We have a, um, with binding and even more enclosing of the head and the tail that goes on for a little while. And then we have the head and the tail spread. Shape flow is still happening. There, shape flow stops. There's a meandering pathway. And then the head and the tail uh, enclose again. And that happens for a little while. And then there, the um, antenna spread and rise. The wings spread to a wall shape. There's an air moment and flight. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's it. Um, we, I guess what we want to say is that we just, uh, we're, we're at the beginning of something. And um, we're really excited about using an entirely different system for trying to study animal movement. And we have a lot of ideas about interesting questions we could answer with this system. Um, you saw a little bit of it with the different flower types. Um, we can look at, we can actually sort of quantitatively measure differences in behavior across flower types. Another example that you're probably very familiar with is pesticide use. Mm -hmm. There are sublethal effects of pesticides that are very hard to quantify. So bee behavior changes, but they're not, they're not dead, but they're behaving more differently. Mm -hmm. And so if we could quantify those effects with a system like that, it'd be really exciting. So what we'll do after each um, presentation is we've invited two of the participants in the ELU Carl's collaborative study to give us a bit of a reflection and lead us into deep query about what is going on. So, um, <laughs> Charlie Betterhold and Anna Brown, we've invited them to be our respondents, our initial respondents after each presentation. So why don't you come up and uh, um, we'll stand over here again. And see if you can do any better job of being than me. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you guys so much. That was really, really wonderful. Yeah. I kept thinking as you were doing, going through this, that it was kind of, it was the perfect pair, you know, like the, the, the kind of someone who studies bees and that there's a natural movement kind of, and I was wondering, you know, if you were paired with someone else in the group, how that would have worked out because it seemed like such a natural kind of, um, really cool progression um, kind of, of both of you taking on things from from the other. Um, so I, that was one of the things that I was most struck by was just what a cool combination. Um, and I didn't know, uh, forgive me for not knowing, but um, if that was intentional, you know, if, if the partnering was intentional or not. As far as we know. <laughs> <laughs> we were paired. Geologist, a, sh a, a plant ecologist, um, would have been radically different, mm -hmm. but it would have worked. I mean, it yeah. seems like this is natural, but I think every one of these is, is in a weird way seem like, oh, well, of course that was the parent. What I was struck by was how just, how much this just made sense from, <laughs> from, both, from both sides. Mm -hmm. And uh, as an audience member who uh, I don't know a thing about bee movement, and I know just as much about dance. I had, no, I had no, no idea that there was a form of notation for dance. But even after just you guys just giving two examples and just looking at that, looking at that third image with no explanation, you could just, in just a blink of an eye, you could just get a, even if you didn't understand each of the little movements, you get this really great understanding of what was going on. And with, you know, you, I'm sure um, you, you've trained your eye to be able to look at uh, a, a segment of video or a, a, like a, an equation or an algorithm and be like, oh, I, I understand what that means. Yeah. But uh, to be able to have that for an audience who knows nothing about either mm -hmm. and to come in and for you guys to produce something that's that intuitive, <laughs> that's just so cool. And it also, it made me think a lot about how your roles as teachers kind of played into um, I mean, because this is this is in its own way a performance, and you know, I mean, you're learning from each other, and you're kind of it's like how much of that is is learning 
from each other, and then how much of it is kind of thinking about your audience that you're then going to present something to. Because mm -hmm. um, that, you know, as we're going through this, I was like, they're just, I mean, they're up there teaching us about this something kind of totally new, which mm -hmm. is really cool. Um, one of the things that I was really curious about was um, kind of what there was in shared vocabulary already. And, um, and, and what, like, what you were doing, yeah. like, what you know. I mean, some of this obviously, like the notation you added to, um, but how much either of you kind of had some common ground that you started with and how you were able to find that. Not much. I mean, I think that first day was, I think, challenging because um, I came into it with my sort of idea about how you look at movement. And she had a totally different vocabulary and way of looking at movement. And we were kind of doing this for a while. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was trying to. So I was saying when I came into it with a certain way of looking at movement um, that was very different from her approach to looking at movement. And so I think we started out kind of walking next to each other, um, you know, talking a little bit. But we finally kind of came to this middle ground where there are subtleties that I know from the biology that I could tell her about. But there were, um, I don't know, essences or, or characteristics of that movement that she could see that were not at all obvious to me until she pointed them out, right? Like the head tail thing. That was not what my eye was drawn to. So it took some time, I think, to try to build a shared vocabulary. Um, yeah. Yeah. The, one, of the, one of the other things that I thought, um, and, and you mentioned how, how similar a lot of this is to how music is written, that uh, there could be uh, an interesting way to add sound into the, into the mixture uh, and in a really you know, simple visual way to get sort of an extra uh, sensory input to you, get the, you have the movement, but then you also have some of the sound of what's, of what's going on. Yeah. It's very cool. Yeah. Uh, do you have any? Well, I don't know. I mean, it, it's like it's so thought-provoking and interesting, and I, I think your idea. I would be so curious about how, you, if you do end up taking it somewhere, um, you know, further with other species, or just this idea, yeah, the pesticide use, um, and it, that's. I think that'll be really fascinating to see, you know, how and if it works out. Yeah. Do you do you guys see this as something you'll continue working on? Um, and moving forward, something that you know might be uh, a little bit game changing for both both of you guys. Uh, I would love to. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, maybe U Cross has some space. <laughs> I certainly couldn't do it on my own without sitting next to Rachel and look at these videos and come up with these. It would take me years of training, I think. To, to even get to be able to come close to doing what she does. And, so. I, and I think what's been really great about this partnership is really been a it's really been a collaboration. <laughs> like it's not something where he could just teach me everything and I could go off and do it or I could do, you know it's really been um, a kind of back and forth. Yeah. yeah. Audience questions, comments, observation. It's interesting how your thinking might be changed a little harder to see mm -hmm. <clears throat> how your thinking as a um, as an artist and dancer has changed. So I started thinking about the artists that have worked, the conceptual artists that have worked with instruction, which is not my approach to art. Um, but so somebody like Saul Witt, who you know works with quantifying instructions, looks for that space in between what's quantified and what's was human, you know, what, what, what other things might arise that are not, that are not expected, that vary from, um, you know, each time that, that piece is enacted. Um, so I'm, I'm really interested in that, that distance between what you did here with the bees, that's very specific to, to how that's affected your dance practice and, is it, is it often a new kind of movement? Is it, like, wh where does it get, do you see it as taking in some, um, taking it away from the quantifying into some? We kind of had a lot of conversations to, uh, about, you know, when we, we, the first couple days we went on a landscape together, the artists and scientists, you know, and, and, and you know, and very generally the scientists would be like, oh, there's this thing, and they would tell us all about it. 
And you know, after the first day, they were like, why aren't you guys talking? Like, why aren't you saying anything? You know, like, no, we want you to talk more. Like, what are you seeing? What are you, you know, and it's kind of, we're kind of like, well, we just kind of have to process. We kind of have to see what's out there, and then we go back. And I feel like that's kind of how I would answer your question, that I'm not sure yet. There are things that I can kind of think about. You know, like, I talked about how in doing this, when we were doing it together, I had a really hard time going back and, like, distancing myself enough from the analyzation, because it's so specific. I mean, the language is so specific. Um, so that's one thing that I noticed right away, but I, what I feel like is that this is all kind of here now, but it's still kind of, it's still in the like I'm processing it, and I'm not sure yet how that will actually manifest itself in terms of my creative work. With that said, have you made up symbols before? No. Is that a new thing? No. So that's actually... So like basically we're adding, to, I'm adding to yeah. the language yeah. right now, because uh, like, there's actually no... There's only been one other in the 60s, something published about notating jumping spiders, I think. Yeah. The mating dance of jumping spiders, but that's it. Um, with this particular, with Laban notation, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, have you worked at all translating this notation into a numeric system that could take some analysis? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a great idea. Um, I think what we wanted to do is see whether or not we could actually watch these movements and, and get them into this, this notation. And I think that that's something that's in the back of my head. Could we come up with a way to quantify this as well? Yeah. I think it would be difficult to quantify in quite that way. I don't know. It's not that it would be impossible. It would be something to try. Yeah. But a lot of the stuff, a lot of the like shaping, it's all about in relationship to. You mm -hmm. know, some of the body part movements, like you were saying, the, the biomechanics, I think you really could. I think it would be a lot harder. I mean, how do you quantify the quality of a movement? And you, mm -hmm. um, you know, so mm -hmm. sometimes, but, but you can see differences between things as you're doing it. You know, like this was the quality here, but look how it changed to here. So even mm -hmm. though it's not as, you know, number oriented, there you can see very visually the image of how it changes. Just in a way, to give you a little background. I come from a family of veterinarians. Mm -hmm. I'm an engineer. I'm married to a geneticist. <laughs> and I've watched over the years, and been puzzled for many years, about the language that animals use to communicate. Hmm. My father spent his lifetime, and my brother spent his lifetime learning the intricacies of how animals behave in a herd. My father hmm. could move into a herd of cattle, and he could detect by eyesight which of the cattle were not doing well. Hmm. He could do the same thing with a herd of horses. And my brother could do the same. They could tell with small animals just literally by body language, <laughs> what was bothering them. I mean, these animals can't communicate. And over the years, evolving from my engineering background to a ranching background, I've watched the same kind of dynamics in deer herds. I've often puzzled how does a wolf pick out the weakest animal in a herd of elk? <laughs> how do they know? How does a lion figure these things out? So what really, in this question, this last question about reducing this to data appeals to my engineering heart. <laughs> Mine too. Uh, I wonder how, what, did you guys look into the repeatability of your movements? I know that these bees, when they get back to the hive, communicate mm -hmm. where these flowers are. I mean, they can move long distances, I, you know, 1,500 feet or maybe more, they go back and they are somehow able to communicate that information to a hive. And I've watched this in process. So what's the repeatability? I often wonder about that repeatability in a herd of animals. Mm -hmm. So you come up with this iconograph iconography. Mm -hmm. If you can get that into some kind of a form like telegraphy or semaphore or some of these languages that humans use, Mm -hmm. speech to communicate. Mm -hmm. If there's some form that you could use I mean, with, what, with the animals, yeah. the, the insects. Uh, yeah. if, if you could find some way to do just exactly that, to find the correlation so that mm -hmm. it could be computerized. Yeah. So one thing that, that I've thought about as a first simple approach is to simply ask how many times do they do certain behaviors that we notice to be very striking behaviors and for how long? So for example, the, in the first one on leafy spurge, that bee is just basically doing this. 
right? I mean, and it's she not. Does it she does it better. <laughs> she does it more dance like. <laughs> um, but there's none of that head tail movement. It's just walking along doing that. And that's something you can quantify. You can say how much of the time is it spent curled up in that 10 second sequence versus spread out? How much of the time is it spent moving its arms to feed? And you can compare that to the amount of time in the other one that it spends completely curled up, kind of moving its way around that potentilla, right? So I think there are aspects of these movements that even if you just said how much time out of that time sequence does it spend doing particular, I think are pretty pronounced, clearly seen behaviors, you might be able to begin to get that repeatability. So if we watch 10 more bees on potentilla, would we see the same thing? Um, and I think too, I think I kind of just want to push back against the idea of putting everything into numbers. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I think it's useful, and that's kind of what he was saying, it's useful information to know the exact biomechan biomechanics and talk about it that way. But there's something about pattern that is really hard when you're looking at the complexity of animal movement to try and quantify it. Because once you get down into these little tiny things, what are you really seeing? There's no way to really see it, right? In, in a kind of a, um, but what, what's happening all together. So yeah, we could say exactly where this is happening. We could say how many times it's happening. But what about like those, like, like I was saying, the effort qualities and things like that. You can't, and that's what we were finding with this. You can't necessarily do that in biomechanics. It's, 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 it's a quality, it's not a, a quantity. And I think that is something that is really useful to apply. I don't know how it would work yet, but how do you take that information and use it in addition to what's already happening? I'm going to have to ask us to stop for now, for now. Um, we're, we've got the next pair. We will be at lunchtime, we will be out with you. And so if you've got questions, observations, grab these people gently. The UCROSS Pollination Experiment was sponsored by the UCROSS Foundation, the Wyoming Humanities Council, Saturday University, the UW Biodiversity Institute, the UW Department of Philosophy, the UW Program in Creative Writing, and the UW Institute for Humanities Research.